So you're very welcome. And we have um, some of um, the IVI um, people in the room here today and some folks online. Um, and thank you, Jim. This is Jim Klein from CGI Technologies and Solutions, who will give today's coffee talk. So you're very welcome. And I will pass it over to you, Jim, and then we'll take some um, questions at the end. Okay. Super. And um, yeah, from the okay. folks online and Let's, in the room. Okay, great. Hey, so, um, okay, go ahead and get started. Uh, so how, how this kind of came about, um, you guys probably know Denise. Denise and I worked together, well, I probably shouldn't say how long ago Denise and I worked together, but Denise and I worked together. She was doing consulting work for a, a company I used to work for called ABB. And actually it was in the area of data and uh, producing uh, uh, production reports for uh, pharmaceutical batch productions. And we found out that the data wasn't there, <laughs> which is exactly the opposite of the talk that we're, we're going to make. Uh, today. But in, in that case, uh, the systems weren't recording the data that she needed for her applications. And we had to identify and, and build that data into the system so that she could collect it and do all the batch production reports and validation reports that were needed for, for that particular um, customer. So we became well acquainted. We spent many a day sitting together in a control room in Cork. Uh, hey discussing lots of things some of them work some of them not but uh, we've been remained friends over the years and uh, we reconnected last uh, earlier this year and she asked me to sit in and do a little bit of a chat um, since that time I've left uh, ABB and I work for a uh, large professional services company called uh, CGI CGI is based all over the world we have about 90,000 uh, IT professionals working in all kinds of industries uh, and all kinds of businesses but today, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about data, and it's sort of, it's kind of crosses manufacturing, uh, process industries, uh, a little bit of space, but it, it, I, I think hopefully at the end, you'll, you'll see a theme of what I was uh, trying to drive at. Um, so today, I'm going to look at a couple different case studies, use cases on interconnected systems or ecosystems, as I call them, and then... I'm going to dive into a, a core component that falls into many production systems called a process historian, and then talk just a little bit about AI, and not in depth, but more just kind of in, uh, some observations from my perspective on uh, on how AI has sort of exploded, but how it really is similar to what what's been going on for for years, especially in manufacturing, and then finally a kind of a riddle, uh, the poor what I call the poor quality riddle, and uh, just ask some questions about uh, about that topic and maybe how AI will play a role, but maybe where AI will still have a gap and, and that's where the humans kind of fit in. So that's kind of what I'm going to try to talk about. Um, I, I think I have about 15 to 20 minutes for this and then some Q&A at the end. So we'll see how fast we can go and, and hopefully it makes some sense by the time I get through it all. Um, so um, this this came up to me and I guess I sort of knew this, but I never really thought about it. But uh, there's a lot of data being collected in space. If you look at what's going on in the Ukraine war with the satellite imaging that's being uh, provided to the various governments to track what's going on, uh, to the farmers who are using satellite data and images to figure out how to irrigate and harvest their crops, uh, watching TV on sports, almost everything comes from a satellite. So there's data being transmitted up and down all the time. Satellite phones are connected and people can connect from basically anywhere. How you pay for your coffee probably goes through some kind of satellite link. So you pay for the coffee, you swipe your card, the transaction goes somewhere, it probably passes through some satellites. And then of course, it, the, the one we know most is uh, you know, data collected for temperatures, weather, uh, watching for hurricanes and, and all that kind of stuff. So satellites and space data is, is integral to everything we do. We don't think about it. It's just there and happens, but it's becoming more and more integrated into pretty much everything we do day in and day out. And, you know, it's playing a bigger role in things like climate change, how we can impact climate change, how cities are, are going to function, basically keep, you know, understanding what, what's going on in the cities, supply chains, 
satellites are being connected to every piece of the equipment for every truck so they can track and optimize how things are moving around and then obviously things like consumer services as i mentioned before retail so you know you, you think your credit card is just your credit card but your credit card's likely attached to to a satellite so you know it just it's it's just kind of an observation that we don't think about space data but space data is all around us and space, we're using data from space in lots of things that uh, we think are commonplace but uh, it's kind of amazing that uh, you know everything we do probably has some space data tied to it um, moving on from that I, I wanted to highlight a, a project that's using space data that I thought was kind of interesting and, and again it ties to the you know the whole green initiatives and reducing carbon footprints but there's something called seagrass and seagrass is one of the big carbon sinks it can grab um, okay. can grab the carbon 35 times faster than the rainforests and in the UK they're they're working to promote this and what they're doing is they're using satellite data to work with you know basically look at the satellites look at the imaging find these sea grasses they're using AI and imaging to to figure out where these things are and try to protect them so that they can create new areas to uh, reduce CO2 emissions and, and CO2 consumption. So I thought that was just kind of kind of interesting. And again, it ties to data everywhere, data coming from everywhere. Um, data being used more and more and more and more in unique ways that you know we hadn't thought about five years ago, 10 years ago, because we just didn't have the capabilities. Moving on. So I wanted to also just spend a few minutes and look at the life of an electric battery since everything's going electric, our cars are going electric. The, the simple battery that goes into a car is, is tied into so many different ecosystems and systems that are generating data and data that's being used for different things. So if you start at the very beginning of a, a, a battery, you have uh, a mine, which is producing the raw materials. So you have all the all the data that a mine needs to generate for its production, production reports, data quality, um, supply chain information, orders, everything that goes on in the mines, um, <clears throat> generating the, the raw material itself. And just a side note, um, many of the mines are becoming electric. So even the vehicles and machinery that are running the mines themselves, including these large, large uh, caterpillar uh, dump trump, dump trucks and bulldozers are moving to become electric. And uh, there's a number of electric mines being developed or re repurposed uh, all over the world right now. So they are also be consuming what they're producing, which are, which are the batteries. So you take a battery or you take the raw materials, you start creating a battery. Batteries used to be pretty dumb. You stick them in your flashlight and they just work. Now the batteries rely on a battery management system. The battery management systems talk to each other to figure out how things need to be charged. The battery charging systems talk to the cloud to understand how and where to charge things. You've got diagnostics that are tied into the battery systems. They're feeding um, edges and your car itself is now becoming an edge. Uh, so you've got a car that's now a data producer with batteries that are talking to the edge. The edge is then talking to the cloud. The cloud is figuring out that the battery's working okay or not. There's other subsystems in a car that are also becoming edges. And even the tires are becoming IoT devices. So they're, they're monitoring their own pressure. They're telling the driver, hey, there's a gas station coming up. You might wanna um, stop and get air in your tires. And over time, we see that um, the tires themselves might start reporting potholes in the road because they can sense them and they're, and they're able to provide that data via the car to the cities to say, fix this pothole. Then on top of that, you've got the EV services. So you've got EV services that are charging the batteries. They're communicating with the chargers. The chargers are communicating with their utilities. The utilities are gathering data. You've got retail 
merchants that are selling the services of charging. They might have it at a gas station. You might now start seeing that at supermarkets. You might see loyalty programs. You might see the need for scheduling of your EV charging. So all kinds of ecosystems that didn't have touch points before are now beginning to touch each other and cross. So, so that EV battery, which you think sits in the car, passes, you know, keeps the car running, is connecting and using all kinds of different systems and producing all kinds of new data that can be used in many, many different ways. And then finally, at the end, when the battery begins to uh, degrade, then it's tracked, it's recycled. Hopefully it's being used in a circular business so that its components are being recycled and remanufactured. And then of course, you've got all the ESG reporting going on related to every subsystem across the entire ecosystem. So, you know, a battery produces a lot of data or interacts with a lot of data. And that's kind of something that I thought was interesting to sort of look at and, and try to understand. And it provides opportunities for lots of new ways of, of sharing and producing new, uh, new opportunities for businesses to capitalize and for people to optimize and, and create better performing um, ecosystems. So um, this leads me to, we've kind of talked a little bit about data and that all kinds of data is being produced. Um, but I wanted to kind of draw your attention to something that happens with all this data that's being produced. Um, you kind of need to know what it's, how it's being produced, how it's being collected and how it's being stored. And when you, if you don't understand these kinds of things when you're starting to use the data, then you can make some incorrect assumptions on, on what, you're, what you're doing with the data. So a process historian is something that's in most kinds of industries, they, they, it collects data and it's designed to collect data at high speeds. It uses all kinds of algorithms to figure out when to store data. It uses dead banding. It uses uh, different algorithms to say, okay, it's traveling in the slope. I don't need to actually store the data. Uh, when you do retrieval, then there's all kinds of ways the data can be retrieved out. It isn't always raw data that's coming out. Often it's interpolated. Um, there's data that's coming out for presentation. So you'll just see a, a curve, but if you zoom in the shape and, and uh, uh, density of the data can change. So there's all kinds of trade-offs with data and how it's stored. A lot of it's related to limitations on uh, the speed. Sometimes it's limitations on the equipment that it's tied to. Um, data storage may be difficult at site, or it may be it, it's able to store it on site, but it's difficult to transmit it uh, off site, even though we have, now have 5G, uh, you know, and coming 6G kinds of transmission rates. But the, the main point here is to basically understand uh, that when you start moving up the chain, and you move away from the data sources, you can start to make assumptions about what you think you collected and how it was originally stored that may or may not be correct. Which leads me to my other topic of AI and modeling. So um, in industry, AI has kind of been around for a long time. It was not really called AI at that time but is in process industries and manufacturing, they've been doing modeling and using something called that they would have called advanced process control to predict uh, future results, create virtual sensors, tune loops based on models and data. Um, so it's been going on for a, a long time. AI is not really that, I mean, it's new. And what we're using it for is, is pretty cool and pretty phenomenal. But the roots and, and the ideas in manufacturing have existed for, for quite some time, especially down at the OT uh, layer. But what has changed, of course, is you know, the, the cloud platforms, the ability to scale, uh, data, more data, and more data is that you know, we tried to illustrate before with the various ecosystems. So we have ecosystems you know, like the space ecosystems and the, the battery ecosystems. So we have much more data. We have the potential to link data that we never had the potential to do before. 
we have modern tooling, which allows people who you know may or may not be mathematicians to do things that they um, need to do, but couldn't do in the past. So the tooling has improved, has made it easier. So the stack itself continues to grow up. And, that, and that's kind of what I wanted to show with the picture on the left. And, and if you think about AI and, and you think about what's happened over the past 30 years, 40 years, 50 years in software development, you had hardware. On top of that, you had operating systems. Then you had device dependent programming, which would be like assembly language programming. Then you had um, device independent programming, which would be programming in C and other things like that. And then you put edges on top and they collect data and move stuff up. And then all of a sudden you can distribute the load and move data to other computers. And then with the internet, you can move data to the cloud and the cloud basically gave you computers at scale that could do all kinds of things. But each way, along each of these paths upward, we basically abstracted the applications one layer up and away from the original um, source. So you, as you move up the stack, you're just moving up and moving further and further away from the original data. So before programming was very difficult, now it's become much simpler. If you look at AI, AI is just a tool sitting on top, just like a, a person who might've done CAD drawings in the past, they did them on paper. Now they use a CAD uh, tooling and they use reusable chunks of code that's already been validated and they can just plug and play and they know that everything works. AI to me falls into that camp. It, it's a new set of tools. It sits on top and it abstracts things a little bit further away from the data, which for me then says AI is great, but you still need to understand your data. And if you don't understand your data, then you can make wrong assumptions because the data that you're using may or may not be what you assumed it started with. And it has some great powers and great powers to do things and create new relationships. Which leads me to my riddle. So um, I had a friend, he worked in polystyrene down in Houston, Texas. He, and polystyrene is basically a polymer. It's just stuff that, you know, uh, it's you make the clamshell boxes that you get food in and things along those lines but and but he had a problem the the products were suffering from poor quality they implemented all kinds of uh, controls advanced process control sbc uh, statistical control advanced modeling they invested in more sensors they invested in analyzers and they could not figure out why they had random poor quality problems. However, one day he realized what was the problem and he realized the correlation that they forgot to take into account, uh, which basically solved his problem. So if, if anybody wants to take a guess, they can come off mute and take a guess. Otherwise I'll flip the slide and I'll tell you what the, what the answer to the question was. Three, two, one. <laughs> no so, guesses yeah. here? <laughs> no guesses. So the answer was actually really simple. It was weather. Weather? Basically, every oh, time it hey. rained, the product <laughs> quality went poor. And they never correlated until he was driving home one day and it was raining. And he realized, and he, it, it's, the next day he went into the office, product quality was poor. And sure enough, they went back, they looked at the data and they could see every time it was raining and the humidity, if you, I don't know if you've been to Houston, but Houston humidity is like a hundred percent most of the time. And when it's rainy, it's even worse. So uh, it was a weather related problem. And the question would be, you know, if you guessed rain, you were correct. Would AI have made the correlation? Maybe but you have to have the data and you had to think about that weather data needed to be brought into your picture and into the model for your uh, problem to be solved. So that is my coffee talk for today. I, I wanted to just kind of share, there's a lot of ecosystems with a lot of data. Um, there's base technologies that stores the data 
but you need to understand how it's being stored. AI is really cool. It can do lots of stuff, mm -hmm. but if you don't understand your data, then your AI may make the wrong choice. And in this case, I don't know if it would have made a good choice or not. I haven't tried this. And I, I will ask my friend if he thinks that AI would have solved this, but we haven't had a chance to talk yet. So, and that ends what I wanted to share today in this coffee chat. So. Brilliant. And thank you, Jim. Very interesting presentation. Um, I am happy to open the floor and anyone online for questions. <clears throat> might just uh, start start off um jim i, I suppose um there's you're in your new role now you're working with a lot of different industries and different yep. companies uh globally and as you mentioned all the, the various different um ecosystems that are there but maybe not all, not all connected but are you seeing a kind of a shift in industry and the companies that you're dealing with to kind of be more open maybe around data sharing and, and the infrastructure and the models and, and regulations and everything that kind of goes with that? Are you seeing a shift at the moment or is it still? Yeah, yeah actually, that's an excellent question. Uh, we are, um, especially when it comes to um, green stuff, ESG and sharing data that you need to share downstream. If you're a supplier, you need to share the ESD data that is required by your clients so that they can do their ESG reporting. So, but you need to do it in a way that is uh, safe and secure and doesn't give away uh, your trade secrets. So as an example, um, let's say you are the US military and you are buying, materials from somebody to produce something, but you also supply something to somebody else. You don't, you don't want to give away your suppliers and you don't want to give away any of the data that's not required, but at the same time, that entire chain of data needs to be uh, auditable. So if somebody needs to look at the data, you can come back in and you can follow the chain of data back to its sources and verify that all that data is, is, um, is auditable. Uh, we're seeing that with uh, up in Finland. We developed some applications in Finland for sharing of data for uh, uh, for power production, and they're doing it in Poland as well. So they've created this uh, uh, data marketplace application. They call it we we CGI has a, a product called Agile DX, and basically it's a way of sharing your data, but protecting the data and the sources, but may, doing it in an auditable way. So yeah, hundred percent, especially in the area of, of uh, you know gr green initiatives and being able to report your your data up and downstream. Great, thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. So uh, by the way, I'm sitting in India today. Traveling the world, Jim. Still. Uh, the pandemic is over, so yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Is there um, any more questions online, guys? I I would just uh, I'm not very well informed on this uh, subject um, about um, data sharing, but I'm just wondering if um, there's any regulation likely or imminent or um, if people have considered regulation around this area, it's just, um, I'm aware of yesterday, I read an article about how um, Hewlett Packard have been doing something with uh, printers and not allowing other companies to create what they see as counterfeit printer cartridges to use in their yeah. printing machines. That happened to me last week. <laughs> I tried Did it? To put yeah. A, yeah, I've tried to put a cartridge into my printer and it said it couldn't use it because it was not an HP cartridge, so yeah. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think a lot of data or, or, I, I worry. I'm worried that a lot of technology and technological advancements that could be used for the benefit can be also used for the benefit of capitalism, if you like, um, mm -hmm. to the detriment of consumers or to the detriment of the environment. I mean, if you had an alternative con um, um, cartridge for your uh, 
printer there yesterday, it would have been ideal if you could pop the, the, the cartridge in and it would work in any printer and that would be um, more environmentally friendly for everybody than yeah. you have to go out and buy a new one. But I, I was just tying that in in my head with that John Deere issue around um, last year there were um, issues with uh, farm machinery that was stolen from the Ukraine by Russia and John Deere hit a dead switch in all of the parts and components of these farm machines that were robbed from Ukraine and they couldn't any of them or parts of them be used by the Russians who'd stolen them and I, I think that sounds great from one perspective but then from another perspective um, farmers are nothing if they're not um, ingenious and they're not able to recommission various right. items on their farms to make things work and it means that farmers are dependent on John Deere for all parts or else they their machine won't work unless their spare parts come from John Deere, if that makes sense. And I, I know there's data being gathered all the time. Yeah I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if there's any regulation around how that data can be used for the positive as opposed to potentially exploited for the detriment of consumers. Does that make sense to you? I, I think I understand the question. I'm not sure I have an answer in that area. That's not something I focused on, but you raise a really good point. It's it's the, the data that's produced or the the machines themselves have this uh, capability and you know we've been talking about data just in terms of sharing it because it's needed downstream for reporting but what what does it mean to hinder a a farmer from doing his job if he <clears throat> if he has to buy a, a john deere component yeah I, I, it just concerns me that, um, you know, even I remember a few years ago buying a fridge and being told that the sh soon fridges would be smart and they would be able to inform me on my phone what I right. needed to buy. And that sounds great as long as I'm not poor and it's only telling me to shop in particular stores. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I'm aware of all this data being accumulated, but I'm, I'm wondering how democratized the data could be. Does that make sense? I think it makes sense. I think people have to look at how the the... You know, there, there's the one view of the world which says, okay, I, I want my monopoly. But I, I think over time, we almost always see that as things open up, there creates new opportunities. Mm -hmm. So so, so I, what I've just experienced in life in general is things contract. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> a couple of vendors sort of take the lead and they might push in a certain direction, but then it opens back up again. Okay. So there's these, there's these contractions and expansions on, on, uh, on different things. Hmm. So I I agree with you. You know, there it, it does make it difficult when when Samsung says you can only shop at Spar. Yeah. Or not really mm -hmm. shops at Spar, but says hey, you should go to Spar because they're having a, a sale on, on yeah Chris Chris or something. Yeah. 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 But, I, but I think I think Bernard, that you raised also an interesting question, particularly with John Deere uh, around on the end shouldn't. The, the farmers benefit from that, like not even, they, they basically grade the data and all this and on the end it just goes automatically and with the HP printer, I was also annoyed. So I, I, I downgraded the operating system on the end, but anyway, <laughs> that's just, um, so, but it's basically, so what do you buy? Who owns the thing? Who owns the data on the end? Yeah. All of this ownership well, uh, uh, concept. Uh, but, but then you can take it one step further, right? So if you say, okay, John Deere uh, has all this data and whoever else has all this data, but they need to be able to then not just turn the switch, they need to be able to add value to you, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So if John, if John Deere is going to collect this data, then there has to be value to you, like telling you, hey, the, mm -hmm. next Tuesday, your tractor is going to stop working because this part is vibrating mm -hmm. and it's going to fail within a week. Mm -hmm. And if, if the farmer can see from John Deere that it's going to fail within a week, so his tractor doesn't have downtime, mm -hmm. right? Then, yeah. then there's value in that data to the farmer for, for John Deere to collect it. But if it's yeah. just a one-way capitalistic approach, then, then yeah, it's, it's, it's not very useful. But, and I, I think what I've seen most of the time is, is that, yeah, people collect it and they think that they're going to use it for for um, trying to monopolize their clients. But the reality is the clients, like you said, will say, well, no, uh, thank you very much. I will downgrade, I'll use a different vendor. They've got to use that data to create value. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, you know, I think you guys probably have all heard about GE engines on airplanes, right? So GE no longer, uh, in the most part, doesn't sell the engines on the jets they lease them based on uptime. Oh, wow. 
So they want to keep the planes running, right? So there's all kinds of IoT sensors on the planes. And if they sense that an engine is beginning to have a problem, they have the part shipped. It's sitting in Frankfurt or someplace, and they, a technician is replay, repairing it as quick as possible because GE isn't making money if that engine's not in the air. Likewise with our farmer and John Deere, John Deere should be keeping that farmer running his, his, his farm fields. So that's the models I think people are, are working towards. They don't always have them set up correctly yet, but I think that's where people will get value out of, hey, John Deere is monitoring my tractors. They know that it has a fault. It's gonna, it's gonna tell me so I can get it repaired and I don't come out in the morning, which by the way, happened to me last week. I went out with my tractor. I have a, a rather large yard and my tractor didn't start. And it turned out that I had a faulty wire in my, in my tractor, but I had to send it into the shop, but it would have been really great because I had a really limited time to cut my grass before <laughs> I came to India. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great if somebody could have told me my tractor wasn't going to start because I had like four hours to cut my grass and I didn't I wasn't able to cut my grass. Mm. So I think yeah. that's I think that's where the value is going to come from. And it has to. Otherwise, you know, the people will walk away. Mm. Like you said, if it's just used to lock you in, uh, it's not then it's not really valuable data. It's, mm. it's it, sorry, is there a time for one last question, Carl? Yeah, go for ahead, me, it's Brian. Fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Jim. Thank you very much hey. for a very clear uh, presentation. I, I learned a lot. Thank you. I, sure. I just one question. E ecosystems are complex um, uh, enterprises, and um, the data flows across enterprises in the ecosystem, they are also quite okay. complex. And I'm coming back. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm hearing, if people are hearing me okay. Um, I'm hearing you. Mm -hmm. So, so the data flows in um, ecosystems are, are quite complex uh, and they all often, or they sometimes mask underlying power asymmetries. You know, you, you, may, you may have a large platform company in, in an ecosystem working with a, a startup. Uh, yeah. So they're, they're not exactly equal partners uh, all, all of the time when it comes to... Right. IP yep. and data flow. Okay, yep. so my question is, are, are there modeling systems out there to model the data flows in ecosystems? Are there... I don't know the answer to that question. I know, you know, if you look at digital twins, that sort of starts to model it from a entity perspective, but not necessarily the full flow. I know that's been a problem that you know we we've seen a number of people try to address. There, I know there's some software from SAP that tries to model data and the and the process flow. I can't remember the name of the the particular product right sure. now, but uh, I mean there there are some, but there's a lot of manual labor because of how disconnected the systems have been for years and now they're finally able to connect them and there's so many legacy systems you know everything everything is sort of organically grew up separated and now you've got this opportunity to begin interconnecting them but there's all kinds of legacy stuff that lies around so people are sort of just sharing information sort of ad hoc so i don't think there's a lot of data governance in how that's done yet there's just people are working their way through it I know we're starting a big project with one of our clients in that area. They've got 15 or 20 different systems doing different things and they have no data governance over the whole thing. You know, they've got a, a materials catalog, they've got uh, parts catalogs, they've got uh, vendors and clients and software subscriptions and service contracts. So they've got all these systems and they, kind of exist and they kind of connect, but they don't really connect well. So okay. I think that's an interesting, I think that's going to be a really interesting challenge of how to create interfaces that allow this kind of connection to happen. 
Thanks, Jim. And uh, if it's any consolation, I ask this question a lot, and and mm -hmm. I always get the same answer. It, 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 it's needed, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, yeah. I, I guess but, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to be able to do ultimately, is model the perturbation on an ecosystem of a, a change of one of the fundamental actors in the system. So. Mm -hmm. if, Mm -hmm. You've got if if you've got a system with a large partner, you know, um, Vodafone or Huawei yeah. or whoever it might yeah, be yeah. in a telecom system. How, how, how does the ecosystem resilience uh, be affected by that perturbation? Um, I mean, in, in the ideal world, you'd, you'd like to think that that might be possible. Anyway, thank yeah. you. Very, thank and, you. And, and and be able to simulate it right before you went and did it. Just say what's going to happen. Yeah, that would be really good. I think. Part of the problem is we have so many legacy systems, right? Every, yeah. Everybody made these design choices and they were all made in silos and uh, yeah. there's politics and everything else. Thanks very much. Thank you. Sure. Thank you again, Jim. If there's no sure. more questions, um, we will leave it there for today. But thank you very much and everyone sure. for joining and thank you to Jim. Um, so please, I've been just sharing the slide there for, for staying in touch with IVI and through our social media channels. And we'll continue our coffee talks next week. So I hope you can join us. We will hear from Mansoor Ahmed from IVI. And uh, we look forward to that. And Jane, thank you again so much and everyone for joining.